Okay, so um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging my collaborators here. So this work couldn't have been done without the team from the Marine Parasitology Lab at the University of Queensland, uh, my colleague Pablo at SeaWorld, and also note that this uh, research project was inspired by Joanna Brown's PhD on parasites in jellies, um, which she finished a few years ago. So this idea that jellyfish are trophic dead ends has now been overturned, and we you know we know that lots and lots of different predators eat gelatinous zooplankton. But all of the methods that we use to try and look at predation on gelatinous zooplankton have limitations and biases. So traditionally, we've used things like gut content analyses, so effectively just looking at what's in the gut to see if we can identify gelatinous material. But of course, gelatinous material is digested very rapidly relative to other prey, um, and it's also very difficult to identify. Now, metabarcoding can really help with the identification these days, but regardless, gut content analyses just provide a snapshot of what the animal has eaten over the last few hours. So biochemical traces are really useful in terms of offering a time-integrated analysis of diet. So they tell us what an organism has been eating over periods of weeks to months beforehand. However, they are very limited in that we can't actually work out what the specific species of prey is. So we can usually work out a general group of prey, but trying to work out the individual species is a lot more problematic. And advances in camera technology are really exciting because we can now put cameras on all sorts of different animals. So these are things like turtles and penguins. And these are revealing some really novel predators of, um, of gelatinous zooplankton. But of course, there's only certain animals that we can actually put cameras on. Um, so things like penguins are great because we can, get the uh, we can get the penguins back and the cameras back. Okay, but there's lots of predators for which camera technology just doesn't work. So ideally, what we need is a method of identifying predators of gelatinous zooplankton that is a time-integrated method, so it's not just a snapshot, and that also um, enables the identification of, of this actual species of gelatinous prey in, in the, you know, that's being consumed. And this is where parasites might be really, really useful. So many endoparasites, so these are things like flukes and tapeworms, they often have multiple hosts in their life cycles. And quite often, the, the different stages of the life cycle pass from um, one host to the next via predation. So things like Digenian, <laughs> Digenian trematodes are a really good example of this. So these are parasitic flukes that have two, three, and sometimes even four different obligate hosts in their life cycle. And here's an example of a Digenian life cycle that includes a gelatinous prey. So here we've got Trachurus, um, a fish. Okay, we also we know that these mackerels eat a lot of uh, gelatinous prey. They host Monascus filiformis, which is a type of Digenian Digenian trematode. The fish is the final host in the life cycle, and they host the reproductive trematodes. So the trematodes reproduce, um, they release their, their larvae. The larvae then uh, swim and occupy a uh, bivalve mollusk as the first host. Then inside the bivalve mollusk, the uh, parasites turn into cicariae. The cicariae then burrow out of that host, and then, then they burrow into the second intermediate host, which in this case is Liro Liriope, um, a hydrozoan. And they develop into what we call the metacicariae in the hydrozoan. And then the definitive host, or the final host, um, gets infected by the parasite when it actually eats the second intermediate host. So this is evidence, if you like, of predation by Trachurus on uh, the hydrozoan. So digenians are going to be most useful as um, trophic tracers when the parasite-host relationship is really species-specific. Now, identifying the metasicaria stage is really, really tricky if, it, you, if you're just using uh, morphology alone, and this is because they don't have the adult reproductive characteristics that are usually diagnostic. So for this reason, we actually need to use genetic sequencing to reliably identify them. So this is where the relationship or collaboration with the Marine Parasitology Lab uh, really came into the fore. Um, so they have been working on uh, parasites in fish for over 40 years, and they've actually sampled more than 4,000 individual fish um, and from over 300 different species of fish, uh, often within Australia but also in international um, areas. And they've identified over 140 species of fish trematodes, and they've got their genetic sequences available for many of them. So the aims of this collaboration was to identify novel predators of gelatinous zooplankton by comparing the genetic sequences of the metasicariae found in the gelatinous zooplankton to those in the adult um, digenians found in the fish. We also wanted to just assess the basic diversity of digenians affecting, uh, infecting in gelatinous zooplankton and also the specificity of the host um, digenian relationship. And also just to close the life cycle on some of the digenians by, by identifying the intermediate hosts. So to do this, we sampled a lot of gelatinous zooplankton. So we sampled 587 individuals from 29 species of Cnidaria, Tenophora, Thaliations, and Heteropods. 
And samples were collected um, in the coastal waters um, in southeast Queensland, but also on two oceanographic voyages, one that just went in and out of Brisbane and sampled southeast Queensland waters again, but offshore, and another that um, cruised from Hobart up to, uh, up to Brisbane, and so allowed us to take samples along the east coast. And this is how we sample them, just using nets. So either just nets off the side of the boat. Thanks, John, for, for helping out there. Um, on the ship, we use the bongo nets, but we often just saw lots of gelatinous zooplankton um, on the surface. So we also just leaned over the side of the boat with a very big net and um, scooped them up as well. So we had to extract the uh, digenins alive um, from, the, uh, from the hosts. And this is what um, a hormifera, a type of tenophore that's infected by digenians look like. So all of those little dots indicated by the arrows are digenians. They're actually, you know, in the transparent species, they're actually very, very easy to see. So we, dissect, uh, we extracted the digenian metasicariae um, from the live jellies, and it's a little like trying to pull a grain of sand out of uh, egg white, and doing that on a moving ship can sometimes be a bit tricky. Um, and we then took the ITS-2 and COX-1 um, sequences for them. And then the sequences of the metasicaria were compared to the sequences of adult digenians from um, the database in the marine, par marine parasitology lab and also to relevant sequences on GenBank. And I guess the first conclusion is that digenians infect a lot of different types of jellyfish. So here we've got a list of uh, taxa for which we had sampled more than 10 individuals, so it had a reasonable sample size. And if we just look at the cnidarians, two out of the three species of cnidarians that we comprehensively sampled were infected. Uh, all seven of the hydrozoan species we looked at were infected. Four out of, out of the four tenophores that we looked at were infected. We didn't find any in the two species of selp that we looked at or in the one heteropod, although we know from the literature that those species that we were looking at uh, do actually carry um, digenian infections at some time. The rates of infection vary a lot among taxa, so the dark blue represents um, the number of individuals in which we found the parasites. So things like um, Aldus ladia magnificus, um, a large hydrozoan, you know, had about an 80% infection rate, as did uh, the scyphozoan Chrysora pentastoma. Catastylus mosaicus, we didn't find a single digenian. Um, and, you know, Eutemia and Liriope, other hydrozoans, had fairly low rates of infection. If we look at some of the tenophores, again, infection rates range from about 80% down to about 10%. Okay, so digenians confirm some of uh, what we knew were predators of gelatinous zooplankton. So here we've got Prodistium, which hasn't yet been um, identified or hasn't been assigned a species name, but this one species of, of digenian was found in two uh, scombrids. So scombrids are really well known for eating gelatinous zooplankton, and we found the corresponding metasicariae in three species of scyphers of, uh, of Nidarian medusae. So in this case, the relationship isn't very specific. The digenian can affect multiple um, final hosts or multiple, multiple um, intermediate hosts. But it does tell us that these scombrids are probably feeding on um, these types of Nidarian medusae. Digenians also confirm some plausible predators of gelatinous zooplankton. So here we've got Kumara brei, and this species of digenian was actually first identified um, in Monodactylus argenteus. And it was only when we did the study that we finally worked out that Puchia falcata is the intermediate host in this life cycle. Now, Monodactylus uh, tends to feed on uh, uh, invertebrate epibiota and also on zooplankton. So it's actually quite plausible that it could also be feeding on things like uh, Puchia falcata, um, but this was the first time that it, that had actually been documented. And then we've got a case where digenians in identified what we think are some novel predators of gelatinous zooplankton. So Berylin Dong, a uh, PhD student at the Marine Parasitology Lab, had just described this brand new species of digenian, Opiconodes opisciporus, and she'd actually identified it in 12 different uh, damselfish hosts from the Great Barrier Reef. And her paper was about to be submitted when we got some of our sequences back and we went, hey, look, we actually found the intermediate host, which were tenophores, and we actually found this parasite in three species of tenophores. So we know that some damselfish do eat uh, zooplankton, but some of the species that uh, she found the parasite in hadn't really been known to feed on, on zooplankton, and certainly not gelatinous zooplankton. So this probably is some novel or new predators of gelatinous zooplankton. What's really interesting here, though, is that all of the tenophores that we sampled were south of the Great Barrier Reef. And in fact, the Bolanopsis that we sampled, we collected off Tasmania. So this raises some really interesting questions. Is this parasite just really widespread, and perhaps we just haven't sampled enough fish around Tasmania to know that it also occurs down there as well? 
Or perhaps some of these tenophores are actually being advected south on the East Australian current. So maybe they originated up on the Great Barrier Reef and are being advected further south. So these parasites can also be used to ask and potentially answer some really neat um, ecological questions as well. Okay, so gelatinous zooplankton host a really rich and diverse endoparasite fauna. Um, Digenians in some gelatinous zooplankton uh, correspond to parasites that infect fishes that we already know prey on jellies or for which predation on jellies is plausible. But in other cases, the Digenians indicated potential novel trophic relationships. So we think that parasites are really um, useful for tracing predators of gelatinous zooplankton, but there's actually a lot of work that we really need to do in this space to confirm their use as a tool. So the specificity of the relationships is often unknown. Okay? We don't know what we haven't yet found out. Okay? So determining specificity can be quite tricky. We also don't know how long the parasites live within the host. So quite often it's periods of weeks to months, but this hasn't been confirmed, certainly for the parasites that we've been looking at. But if we can get in some information on that, it'll be really useful for telling us things such as, you know, potentially the time window in which the predation occurred. And it could also be useful for looking at things like ontogenetic shifts in the diet um, of the predator. Okay. And, you know, there are also other questions. Does vari a variation in the prevalence and the intensity of um, the infection in the fish reflect predation rates on gelatinous zooplankton? So if the fish are really heavily infected with the parasites, does it mean that they're eating more of um, these gelatinous, uh, pr gelatinous prey? So overall, we think that um, parasites hold a whole lot of potential um, to be really useful indicators of trophic relationships involving de uh, jellies, and they're another tool that we can add to the toolbox for elucidating these trophic links. Thank you.